the sleep of civilization in the present era. Today I would like to continue with the themes of the last two days, Giordano Bruno, Jacob Burma and Francis Bacon on January 12th, and Salt, Mercury and Sulphur on January 13th. Let us look at the developments leading to the spiritual life of the present time, so that we can recognize that the anthroposophic worldview is a necessity in our time. And yet we must expect that anthroposophic insights will have vigorous opponents. I do not wish to mention the specific objections of this or that opponent right now. I prefer to approach the theme in a general way. It is more important to point out that if the anthroposophical society wishes to continue to exist, if it wishes to take its place consciously in today's life of the spirit and to contribute something to it, the society has to consolidate itself. This is not the first time I have said this. Several weeks ago I explicitly pointed out that the consolidation of the anthroposophical society is an absolute necessity. We have to be clear about the relationship anthroposophy has to our present-day civilization. The roots for contemporary civilization in Europe and America go back as far as the fourth century of the Common Era. We must keep in mind that the spread of Christianity and the entire way in which Christianity was grasped and understood in the third to the fourth centuries was fundamentally different from what it became later. We often think that in our present era we can trace historical events backward and move through successive historical periods as if there were a fundamental continuity running through them. For example, we could move backward through the modern period and that would lead us back to the medieval period. From there we would revisit the great migrations of peoples, then the Roman Empire and afterward the culture of ancient Greece. We think and feel about the ancient Greek civilization in the same way we do about the Roman Empire, the Middle Ages, and the modern developments in European and American history. In fact, that assumption is not valid. There is a deep chasm between the continuity extending from modern civilization to the Roman era and the fundamentally different ancient Greek civilization. Let us bring this matter before our souls. When we recall the Greece of Pericles or Plato or Phidias, or the Greece of Sophocles and Aeschylus, we are looking at a soul consciousness that is rooted in the ancient mystery culture and ancient spirituality. Above all, in ancient times classical Greek culture still had within it what I characterized yesterday as a living experience of the real inner processes of the human being, including what I referred to as the salt, mercury, and sulfur processes. The ancient Greek way of thinking and the Greek way of experiencing the human being was closer to the reality of the human constitution than any of the characterizations put forward since the 4th century CE. And we would include the three individuals we spoke about in the last two days among examples of those who had represented a transition to the complete loss of a true understanding of the human constitution in modern consciousness. Personalities such as Giordano Bruno, Jacob Berma, and up to a certain point, Francis Bacon, struggled to achieve a true understanding of the human being they were unable to reach the full understanding they sought. When we go back further than the Roman era and enter ancient Greek culture, any talk about the limits of knowledge of the human being had no meaning, for the ancient Greeks could grasp the nature of the human being and understood humanity's place within the cosmos. On the other hand, the Greeks did not have the mechanistic view of nature that now holds sway in scientific circles today. 
We could say of the ancient Greeks that they saw clouds and rain streaming down. They watched the mist ascending upward. These processes were expressions of the earth's fluidity. When they turned with acute awareness to the movement of the human blood circulation, they saw it imbued with an essentially living quality. The ancient Greeks did not perceive a difference between the rise and fall of water in nature and the movement of blood within the human body. That is, however, a distinction made in modern science. The ancient Greeks still experienced what lay behind the words, quote, the cosmos is revealed in the human being. The human being is revealed in the cosmos, close quote. These are things we must take very seriously because they lead us to a soul consciousness that now appears only in a fragmented form, at least in terms of the outwardly visible sources of historical documentation. We have to remember that in the 4th century CE, efforts were set in motion to utterly destroy all remnants of esoteric culture. Certainly we know something of this occurrence, on the basis of archaeological excavations. But we have to realize that what later gave impulse to Western civilization arose out of the ruins of Hellenism, a Hellenism that spread not just across southern Europe, but all the way to Asia as well. We must not forget that from the middle of the 4th to the middle of the 5th centuries CE, innumerable temples were burned to the ground temples that were filled with the most important, the most priceless treasures of everything that Hellenism had nurtured and conveyed. Humanity today, which typically is interested only in written documents, can no longer see any of these treasures of Hellenism. We must remember what was recorded in a letter written by a contemporary in the 4th century, quote, The ancient times are coming to an end. Not one sanctuary remains in the fields that were cultivated for the sake of the temples. They have all been destroyed. How can the peasants working in the fields find joy in their work? Close quote. Today it is unimaginable how much was completely destroyed between the mid-4th century and the mid-5th century. The destruction of temples and monuments went hand in hand with the efforts to extinguish Greek spiritual life, a process that received its bitterest blow when the Athenian school of philosophy was closed in 529 CE. We have many resources, artistic and architectural, as well as literary and documentary, that help us to look at Roman society, but it is not possible to recreate ancient Greek civilization in its outward manifestations. It is true that a great deal of ancient civilization was consciously preserved right up through the medieval period. The Benedictine order, for example, participated in this. But even St. Benedict built the first Benedictine cloister on a site that at one time was held sacred by pre-Christian peoples. Whatever had a connection with the past had to disappear, and indeed these traces did disappear. If you think of so-called normal human beings, it is difficult to understand the impulse for destruction that swept across southern Europe, western Asia, and North Africa. We can understand it only if we recognize that the entire consciousness of humanity during that period was completely different. I have often pointed out that it is simply incorrect to say that, quote, nature or world history can never make a developmental leap, close quote. In human history, such a leap can take place. The sole constitution of civilized humanity in the 2nd and 3rd centuries CE was, without a doubt, very different from what came later. Now, I would like to show you how this kind of change functions. When we speak about the transition between waking and sleeping, we say that the physical body and the etheric body remain in bed during sleep, and the I, capital, and astral body leave the physical body. 
To put it another way, the sole spiritual aspects of the human being leave the physical and etheric body. Such a description would not have been used in ancient India. Human beings, then, would have said exactly the opposite. In sleep, they would have said the sole spiritual aspects of the human being enter the physical body more deeply. That is, the process was exactly the opposite of what I described as the present-day constitution of the human being in waking and sleeping states. This difference is seldom noticed today. For example, when the Theosophical Society was founded, some of the founding members heard about spiritual truths from the Indians they met, and the early Theosophists adopted what they heard as their own. They heard something about the astral body and the eye leaving the physical body. Certainly an Indian in the 19th century would have said such a thing, for in India one can often observe what is real. But afterward, when people from the Theosophical Society repeated this, they claimed that the departure of the astral and the eye during sleep was part of ancient Indian wisdom. This is not so. For the ancient Indian actually said just the opposite. The soul spiritual goes more deeply into the physical body during sleep. That was an accurate description of the human being during ancient times. To a certain degree, this knowledge was present to the consciousness of the ancient Greeks, who experienced that during sleep the soul spiritual entered the physical body more deeply than it did when the human being was awake. In this the Greeks manifested a certain stage in the development of humanity. Today when we describe the consciousness of human beings of another time, we must characterize it from our own immediate spiritual perception. And so we rightly say that the sages of ancient times and also the ancient Greeks possessed an instinctive, dreamlike clairvoyance. That is what we would say from our perspective. But those who lived in ancient times would not have regarded their experience as dreamlike. They felt as if they were awake during their form of clairvoyance. When they perceived the world in mighty pictures, as I described it yesterday, it felt as if this was an intensification of their consciousness. They also knew that when they sank into their inner being and saw what occurred within the human being, they experienced themselves in relation to the universe. They knew that the processes within the human being were equivalent to the processes in the universe. During sleep, the ancient Greeks perceived that the human being dipped more deeply into the physical body. In deep sleep, their heightened consciousness once again would be silenced, dimmed, and even become unconscious. They attributed this to the influence of the physical body that surrounded the soul and led it into sinfulness, into iniquity. Precisely this intuitive perception gave rise to the ancient consciousness of sin or iniquity. The Greek consciousness of sin led back to an even more ancient perception that the soul's descent into the physical body prevented the soul from having sufficient freedom to live in the spiritual world. If you think through all that I have said about this, you would have to say that the human being in ancient times was conscious of being a spiritual being, living within a physical body. It would not have occurred then to anyone that the physical body was the defining characteristic of a human being. The essentially human quality in that era was expressed as, quote, the thinker, close quote. The human being was not just a being with ruddy or pale countenance, two arms and two legs. The human being was a soul-spirit being, living within a physical body. The consciousness of the soul-spiritual nature of the human being in Greek civilization is still evident in the remnants of its artistic portrayals of the human archetype, seen in every wonderful sculptural form left by classical Greek culture. 
when gazing at the ruins of a Greek temple, we have to say, though the cults practiced may have fallen into decadence, that even in the ravaged images of the Greek gods and the temples, evidence of the ancient constitution of the soul still exists. Indeed, the old soul-spiritual consciousness of the human being was writ large in the forms that were destroyed. If an initiate from the Greek mysteries of the early Greek era came to us and spoke to us with the consciousness of a Greek incarnation, and not from a subsequent one, that inevitably would be different from that of the ancient Greek era, the initiate would say to us, quote, You modern human beings are the ones who are asleep. We were the human beings who were awake. We were awake within our physical bodies. Yes, we were awake as spiritual human beings living in physical bodies. We knew that we were human beings because we could distinguish our humanity existing within the physical from the physical body itself. What you call being awake was for us being asleep. When you are awake and order your senses within the outer world, and explain something from the point of view of the world of senses, you are asleep in relation to what is the essence of your humanity. You have fallen asleep. We are the ones who were awake. Close quote. That is what an initiate of the ancient Greek mysteries would say to us, and from a certain point of view would be correct. For today we presume we are awake from the time we wake up until the time we go to sleep. That is to say, when we are in our physical bodies as soul, spiritual human beings. But we are not consciously aware of ourselves in that sense, and thus we are asleep with regard to our own essential nature. When we are within the cosmos that exists outside us, we are sleeping. For that happens between the time we go to sleep and the time that we wake up. We need to learn how to be awake when aspects of our being are out in the cosmos. With the same intensity with which the human beings in ancient times were awake within their bodies, the modern human being has to learn how to be awake when the astral and the eye are outside the physical body when we are actually within the outer cosmos. We are in a state of transition. Compared with the human being in ancient times, we have been asleep with regard to the essential aspects of our humanity. Now we are at the point when we should awaken in a new way to a new kind of conscious wakefulness. And what role does anthroposophy play in this? Anthroposophy simply wishes that the human being would learn how to remain awake outside of physicality. And so anthroposophy comes along and tries to awaken the modern human being, the person the ancient initiate regarded as asleep. Anthroposophy wants to awaken the modern human being, but this sleepy head refuses to wake up. Anthroposophy wants to sound the alarm. In the Oberufer nativity play, the shepherd named Huckle tries to awaken his fellow shepherd, Buckle. He calls out, quote, The birds are already singing. Close quote. Buckle rolls over, quote, Let them sing. They've got little heads and they don't need much sleep. Close quote. Huckle tries again. Quote, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. Close quote. Buckle ignores him. Quote, so what? Let the sky fall in. It's already been up there long enough. Close quote. That, of course, is not exactly what anthroposophy is saying. Rather, the call is, quote, the spiritual world wants to come in. Wake up. Let the light of the spirit shine. Close quote. Anthroposophy wants the sleeper to wake up. Modern civilization needs an awakening but humanity wants to go right on sleeping. I want to remind you that Jakob Berma, who was filled with folk wisdom 
and Giordano Bruno, who stood within a spiritual community, preserved a great deal from ancient times and lived within a memory of the ancient state of wakefulness. Francis Bacon, however, had the impulse to justify the sleepiness of modernity. That is, he grasped more deeply than we have been able to do in these past two days what is characteristic of our era. The modern human being cannot reach as deeply into the physical as humanity could in ancient times. For modern human beings during sleep do not enter more deeply into their physical body. Instead, we go out of our physical body during sleep. But modern human beings must also learn to come out of their body during the waking state, for only thereby can we be in a position to know ourselves once again as human beings. Nevertheless, the temptation to prolong our sleep is very great. Quote, Buckle, the riders are already galloping along the roads. Close quote. Quote, Let them gallop. They still have a long way to go. Close quote. Du Bois Raymond said, and I am not speaking now of the shepherd Huckle in the Christmas play, quote, Human knowledge has its limits. You cannot force your way into the phenomena of nature nor into the secret workings of nature. You have to accept the limits to human knowledge. Close quote. But Anthroposophy says, quote, We must strive to go further and further. The impulse of the spirit already is sounding. Close quote. Dubois Raymond would reply, quote, Let the impulse of the spirit resound. It still has a long way to go. It will take natural science until the end of time on earth before all of the secrets of nature will be revealed. Close quote. Human beings already have a justification to stay asleep. The argument to admit to the limits of our knowledge of nature is reason enough for remaining asleep and not bothering to pursue knowledge of the nature of the human being either. There are plenty of sleeping pills in our present age, and you may hear them spoken about right here. Whenever possible, people prefer to listen to what is easily understood, just as if they were watching a film. People do not like it when they have to pay attention and work on something inwardly. Most people prefer to dream about cosmic mysteries rather than to engage them with their inwardly active thinking. The path to waking up, however, begins with thinking, for a thought wishes to become more developed through its own activity. That is the reason why I dealt with thinking so vigorously in my book titled The Philosophy of Freedom several decades ago. My dear friends, I want to bring something to your attention. Think back over the dreams you have had and see if you ever have had a dream in which you did something that you would have been ashamed to do during the day. I mean that seriously. Admittedly, there may be a number of people sitting here who have never had such a dream, but even they will know someone who can tell them of such an experience. There will be those here who can admit that sometimes they have had dreams about doing something that they would not have done in a waking state, which would have made them feel ashamed if they had done so. Let us look at the pervasive, overpowering sleep of our entire civilization, in which people just want to dream through all manner of cosmic secrets. Here comes Anthroposophy saying exactly the same words as the shepherd, Huckle, cries out to his fellow shepherd, quote, Buckle, wake up, close quote. And the people who are dreaming today are supposed to wake up. I can assure you that some things people do during this great sleep of civilization they would not do if they were really awake. That is a fact. But instead the dreamer says, quote, How am I supposed to believe that? Close quote. The dreamer does not give a second thought to what the impossible things that occur in dreams would look like if they were carried out during a waking state. But unconsciously, Many fear that there are things they must not do when they are awake. Naturally, I don't mean this in a trivial or a narrow-minded way. 
Nevertheless, there are many actions that we consider perfectly acceptable and normal, which we would see in a completely different light if we were really awake. There is a deep-seated fear of awakening and being shocked by what is deemed acceptable in the sleep of civilization. If we had awakened from this profound sleep, we would no longer feel comfortable dissecting a liver side by side with the brain. We would feel desperately ashamed to follow some of our current research methods if we truly had awakened in an anthroposophic sense. But we can hardly expect that individuals who stand right in the midst of today's research methods would awaken from one day to the next and suddenly adopt an anthroposophic sensitivity toward research methods without any explanation. We certainly notice the willingness of people to justify the sleep of civilization. Think about the immense joy a dreamer has when something that was dreamt actually occurs a few days afterward. It is immediately evident that these superstitious dreamers are overjoyed when an event in a dream becomes a reality, and that actually occurs occasionally. Dreamers among scientists and mathematicians, whose ideas affect entire civilizations, calculated a specific orbit for the planet Uranus, according to the Newtonian law of gravitation, and the elaboration of the Newtonian formula by later mathematicians. But the actual orbit of Uranus did not correspond to the orbit based upon this calculation. Such mathematicians then dream that the real orbit has been diverted by the existence of another planet, which might possibly exist. The entire process has been dreamt, for it has really been calculated without the impulse or necessity of inner assurance and authenticity. When in fact Dr. Gala discovered the planet of Neptune, It seemed as if the dream had become a reality. Afterward, the sequence of a projected existence of a planet and its subsequent discovery is called a scientific method applied to the world of nature. In fact, the existence of Neptune was projected in a dream, and then thereafter it appeared. That is really how it is with the dreamers, when something presents itself after it first has been dreamt. Or recall how Mendeleev calculated the existence of a new element in the periodic table of elements. That kind of dream is actually not so difficult to propose, because when there is an empty place in the periodic table, it is quite easy to fill in the space with a new element and attribute a few characteristics to this invention. Nevertheless, it is a dream. If the new element does exist, then the method of its discovery is no different than the example of the dreamer who dreams of something that happens to the dreamer a few days later in a waking state. The event in waking life is claimed to be a verification of the dream. The ordinary dreamer does not describe the event in real life as a verification of the dream, but scientists do say that they have been able to verify what previously had been imagined we must first of all fundamentally understand how our modern civilization has become a civilization asleep and how an awakening is absolutely necessary for humanity. Above all, everyone who feels drawn to spiritual science must see right through the tendency toward sleep that permeates our present time. At any moment, you as a dreamer may realize that you are asleep. It may suddenly come to you, I am dreaming. Humanity must be able to experience deeply what the philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte expressed so energetically. Quote, the world that is spread out in front of the human being is a dream, and everything the human being thinks about the world is a dream of a dream. Close quote. But we must not fall into the error that we find in the philosophy of Schopenhauer. There is little to be gained if we simply turn to a theory of knowledge and declare that everything is a dream. It is not our task to point out that the human being dreams, 
and that the human being can never do more than dream. For if we came to the boundary of these dreams, then on the other side is the thing in itself, which by definition can never be reached through the senses. It is interesting to consider what Edward von Hartmann, who otherwise was an outstanding thinker, had to say about dreams in contrast to reality. He said that the human being dreams everything that is present in consciousness, and that behind the dream lies a, in quotes, thing in itself, about which the human being knows nothing. Hartmann pushes the thing in itself to the limit. The table in itself is contrasted to the table we see before us. The table that we see in front of us is a dream, and behind it is the table in itself. Hartmann actually differentiated between the table as appearance and the table in itself, between the chair as appearance and the chair in itself. But he is unconscious of the fact that the chair on which he himself is sitting has anything to do with the chair in itself, for it is difficult to actually sit on a chair that is only an appearance of a chair, one that is no more than a dream. Likewise, the dreamer has to lie down on a real bed. However, this whole play of words that proposes that the world is no more than a dream can be very useful as a preparation for something else. What would that be? It prepares us for an awakening, my dear friends. The point we are making is not to persuade you that the world is a dream. The discussion of the idea becomes the spur to awaken within ourselves. And awakening begins with an energetic grasp of our thinking, an active seizing hold of our thinking. An awakened thinking is precisely what leads you into everything else. The impulse to self-awakening is imperative today. Certainly, anthroposophy can be placed before the world. But if the anthroposophical society wants to be a community, then this community must be real. If you, as an individual, wish to live in the anthroposophical society, you also must experience the anthroposophical society as a reality. You must be permeated by the will to awaken and not take it as an insult when someone says to you, Wake up! Your wakefulness is imperative. Allow me to say this again in just a few words. The misfortune that has just befallen us, the burning of the Gertianum, must be a summons to each individual to wake up, a summons to the anthroposophical society to take action, a summons to make our society a reality. The real being of the society is precisely the being we have experienced, which I characterized at the end of the Christmas course of lectures. The living streaming from person to person within the anthroposophical society must be real. A lack of love between one another rather than mutual trust has become widespread in the newest phase in the life of the anthroposophical society. And if this lack of love gains the upper hand, the anthroposophical society will collapse. Building the Gertianum has brought many beautiful qualities living with an anthroposophists to the surface. But parallel to this, the society itself should have been strengthened. It is true that many fine qualities were reaffirmed at the end of the recent course of lectures, similar to the qualities that were evident during the construction of the Gertianum. And these qualities surfaced again during the night of the fire. But these qualities must be cultivated. Above all, if you have a task to do within the anthroposophical society, a task that goes above and beyond being a member, you really must carry this task out with real personal interest and real commitment. A deep sense of personal interest and real commitment toward the work of the society are unfortunately exactly what is missing. We need people who are ready to carry out a specific task or take on a particular responsibility for the society. No service for the society may be viewed as a small matter, including what one person can do for another. The smallest deed becomes worthy 
because it is also service to the greater whole. That fact is something that is too often forgotten. The society should be deeply grateful when a great misfortune inspires us to act out of our finest qualities of character. But we must not forget how quickly many lose their interest and commitment to a task in the face of the need to continue their efforts on a daily basis. Some take on a task one day and then quickly forget about it. Therefore I want to remind you of the enormous magnitude of the opposition that exists in the world today toward anthroposophy. Indeed, the level of antagonism is often overlooked and underestimated. We must realize that antagonism exists, that opposition exists. We can see this within the course of world events. Sometimes I am amazed how little inner awareness and sympathy there is on our part, especially when the opposition is rife with untruths. We have to remain matter-of-fact and objective in the positive defense of anthroposophy when we are dealing with concrete matters. But we also have to understand that anthroposophy can only survive in an atmosphere of truthfulness. We need to develop a feeling for what it means when so much untruthfulness, so much condemnation is directed against anthroposophic positions. To be prepared to meet these situations, we really need to depend on our inner life. Be assured that we will have plenty of opportunities to stay awake. The impulse to awaken may expand in other ways as well. When we see someone sleeping, even though the flames of untruthfulness are everywhere in evidence, then we won't be surprised when an ordinary human being sleeps on. Now, I would like to take what I have shown you in miniature today and place it before you in its fullest magnitude. Think, feel, meditate on being wide awake. Many long for what they believe is esoteric, even as slander is being nailed on the windows. Dear friends, the esoteric is within grasp. Take hold of it. But the most esoteric task that exists within the anthroposophical society today is the will to awaken. This will to be awake must take precedence in the anthroposophical society. An awakened anthroposophical society will be the ray of light that will ignite the will to awaken our entire present-day civilization.